so you may be wondering, why am I giving a talk on RxJava in 2018 when coroutines are all the rage now? Uh, the reason I want to do this is because I want to approach this as story time. Uh, this is going to be talking about the times where we've used RxJava and it's worked really well for us, and then those times where we maybe went a bit too far and kind of made a mess, and everyone likes learning about those. Um, so before I get started on that, I kind of want to address this question of why have we chased the dragon? Uh, why have we bothered learning this library that has hundreds of operators that kind of involves you inverting the way you're used to programming? You need to think in this pool-based model now. Uh, why would we bother going through that? And to me, the big win has been as an Android developer, we need to compose a whole lot of asynchronous systems and get them to work together in concert. And RxJava is actually a really good tool for managing that. Uh, and by that, I mean we might be writing our code, uh, and then at some point we need to execute a network request. So we send that off, and it comes back, and we don't know how long that's going to take. Uh, but then once we've got that, maybe we need to write it to disk. And that takes a certain amount of time, and then maybe we want to observe as the contents of the disk change over time. We can kind of think of the user as well as an asynchronous system. We present them with lots of different user interfaces, and then at some point in the future, they give us back some inputs. And lastly, it's kind of Android itself is this asynchronous thing we need to work with. There's lots of different async APIs we interface with. And so RxJava for us has really been this great tool in composing all of this stuff together uh, to work as like a cohesive whole. But I want to talk about uh, web services to begin with because I think that's where I got my feet wet with RxJava and where a lot of developers kind of get started. Um, and that's where you start writing code that looks like this. Um, you get used to using retrofit. We're getting something from web services. And we're saying we want to do this on a background thread and then observe it on the main thread. And if you are used to using async tasks, then this feels pretty good. Uh, it's a nice change of pace. And then you learn a little bit more about RxJava and you're like, hey, I can execute this map operator. This lets me transform the data into what I want before I finally consume it. This is fun. And then you go a little bit deeper and you learn about this flat map operator. And now that we're flat mapping, we can take the response of one web service and we can pipe that into another web service before we finally consume the result. And by the time you get to this point, you're like, I'm sold. RxJava is super fun. Look at this neat code I'm writing. It's great. Until you start wondering what happens when things go wrong, how am I going to process an error in this instance? And so my first reaction was, well, of course, it's given me this, this error block that I can use. There's this error lambda that I can use for when something goes wrong. Uh, isn't this what I should be using? And this was probably my first mistake. Uh, this is because in RxJava, an error is a terminal event. And we really need to watch out for terminal events. Terminal events are bad. Uh, it's not so obvious in this example here where all we're doing is executing one request and getting a response back. Um, where this becomes a problem is when you start getting deeper into RxJava and you use this as part of a bigger system. By that I mean maybe we put this sequence of calls inside of a value and now we're actually using this as part of some bigger system. And in this bigger system, if we're throwing an error, that means our entire stream is now poisoned because in RxJava, once you have an error, it means that no other items are coming up back after it. So now, this isn't really good because as an Android developer, a network request is not something exceptional. This is like standard everyday life. This is what we deal with. So we need to change our representation of what this thing going wrong actually is. And so maybe as you're learning more about retrofit, you're like, okay, well, I'll change my interface. Uh, so instead of a single of something, it's going to be a single result of something, something that lets me say, is this success or is this error? And so we go back to our original code, and we're like, we need to make some changes now. Uh, our first result is not quite so neat anymore. We actually need to check, is this thing not an error? And if that's the case, then we can do this flatten up operation. Otherwise, we need something that represents the error type. And of course, it's not quite that simple because the result is just the success of that HTTP request. We also need to look at the response. What did the server give back to us? And there's all of this work we need to do before we even get to this map operation because what are we now getting? It's one of two different things. And you can try and alleviate some of these concerns by breaking things up into different methods, but now you've lost this nice block of code that you once had. To me, there is an answer to this. Uh, that involves something to do with coroutines. Uh, 
I don't want to speak about this anymore because there is another Chris at DevFest and he's going to be talking about coroutines a lot, so I'm not going to step on his shoes, uh, but just look forward to that one. Let's talk about Android. Um, I think this one is kind of more interesting to me, actually, because I want to talk about a project I worked on a while ago. Uh, this was an application for people who were driving alone in a truck in the desert. So let's quickly go through the requirements of this application. We're interfacing with an engine monitoring system. So we're pulling data from the engine itself. This is happening over Bluetooth. Of course, this Bluetooth connection is emulating a serial connection. And while this is happening, we actually need to enable a very slow satellite internet, internet connection. And this is all happening from a box that's sitting inside uh, the cabin of a truck. Of course, this little box wants all of its communications to be done via SOAP. Whilst we're doing this, we're sending location and engine data over that very slow satellite connection. We're talking a speed of bytes per second. And while we're doing this, we need to look at the device's accelerometer, and we're monitoring for potential accidents, maybe a sudden stop or a rollover event. And maybe you're like me, when I first started looking at these set of requirements, it was a little bit like looking at this road sign where you ask yourself, what could go wrong? <laughs> but the other thing is when you look at this, you can also see there's a lot of asynchronous systems at play here, and we need to coordinate them together. I don't have too much time to go into detail, but I want to talk about one of them that was a lot of fun to implement. Uh, and that was how we were monitoring for accidents. So if we think about what's happening here, uh, we want to detect maybe a rollover has occurred. So our truck is driving along the desert, and we really care about harsh gravity increases on the Z and X axes. What we don't care about is the Y axes. If the truck driver is doing sweet doughies, then that's their business. So we're observing the gravity sensor from Android. That's producing these X, Y, and Z values over time. We want to map that to just X and Z, and we don't want to have any duplicate events. We want to check this against some kind of threshold. Do we think an accident has occurred? If we do, we want to throttle these detections within a certain window because we don't want to spam, oh no, error, error, over and over again. And once we've got that, we can actually say maybe an accident has occurred. And when we went to implement this, our codes looked something like this, where we're representing kind of a lot of complicated logic. Uh, you don't need to pay too much attention to it. But the point is that we're doing a lot with very little. And it was sort of this perfect use case of RxJava. I could go on and on about all the things that worked well in this project, how we were processing location updates, those Bluetooth payloads from the engine, so much. Um, but I can only talk about joy for so long before I also mention the things that went wrong. And that's where we started trying to represent some things from Android with RxJava that we really shouldn't have. Uh, and that's things like Android's runtime permissions. We thought, wouldn't it be great if we could model this as a stream, as when the permission is enabled or disabled? Or another really interesting one was when we were trying to model activity results uh, with RxJava. This kind of doesn't make sense, because what's a subscription? What's your stream? You're trying to map these activity callbacks to all of these items that you're pushing into the stream. It doesn't really make sense. It feels clever when you write it, but you're not making good code. So my advice at this point is just write the code the way Android wants you to write the code, and do the Rx at a layer that's kind of higher up than this, because really, you're just making a mess. So let's talk about disk operations. Um, this one, I think, is kind of like a, an easy one to talk about, because everyone's kind of a, I hope a lot of people are aware of that quick win you kind of get when you adopt a reactive programming model uh, with your, your disk and making sure that we're not displaying stale information to a user. And this isn't something that's uh, attached to just RxJava, it's just reactive programming in general. So let's, let's assume we're working on an application here. And in this application, we've got a navigation drawer. And at the top of our navigation drawer, we're displaying some information about the user, uh, a profile picture and a, a username. Now, let's say earlier this morning, uh, this user was not happy with their profile picture. They didn't like the look of it. And they logged on to some web management portal, and they changed their avatar. Now it's, it's later in the day. They've logged into the app. And the first thing we do is present the data that we had, uh, what we had stored on disk, this old information. But in the background, we're running a sync. And once that sync finishes, then we want to make sure that our user interface updates to the lovely new image that the user has chosen for themselves. When I first started writing Android code, I would kind of write code that looked like this, um, where once our view is attached, it would go out and it would grab the dependencies, what it needed, and then stuff them into the subviews. 
and be like, hey, this is done. I'm displaying what I need. This is fine until we need to run that kind of invalidation. And the only way you can get this to update is to coordinate some kind of invalidation event through to your user interface that says, hey, view, you need to go pull your data again uh, to, to show the updated information. It's far easier if you adopt something like this where your user interface is just subscribing to that data on disk. So anytime it changes, it updates. And you don't need to worry about doing that coordination dance to make sure everything's updated. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this other library I wrote a while ago called RxStore that I now have mixed feelings on. The point of RxStore uh, was when you needed something that was more complicated than shared preferences, but less complicated than something like SQL. And the idea was that you create things like stores for, for objects. So in this instance, we want to store a user. We pass it a file, which just says here is where it lives on disk. And we pass it a converter, which is how it gets there. Maybe it's JSON or XML or whatever you want. You could asynchronously update uh, this object as it's stored on disk. And you could also observe it as it changed over time. So far, so good. Where I think I maybe went a little bit too far was I, when I implemented this thing called observe put. Uh, so the idea is this put operation doesn't execute until something subscribes to it, and then it returns a single of that user. The reason why I think I went a bit too far here uh, is because the goal was to compose it with other things. So maybe we wanted to use it as part of a stream. We get the user from web services, and then the next thing we want to do is write that user to disk, and once that's complete, then we want to process the user, but only once those operations are done. And of course, we know it's not quite that simple, right? We're never just going to get this user object. Uh, there's going to be some errors sometimes. And it means that we're probably, we've already got a method in some background thread that we're running that's handling, that's running all of these error cases. In which case, if you're already running in a background thread, why are you trying to have this observe put operation to put everything back in a nice stream? What you've really done is kind of just, you're, you're trying to make RxJava for the point of making RxJava and really just a synchronous write operation in that background thread would have been way simpler. So I'm not sure I'd write code like this anymore. So I lastly want to talk about user interfaces. So I know a lot of people, they write their apps, especially when they're getting like heavy into RxJava, where they, they do something like where they've got a controller and a view, and there's a relationship between them. I'm not necessarily saying that you're writing MVC code. This, could, this controller could be anything. Um, there's a dozen different architectures, more. But the point is that we've got state that gets delivered to our view, and then our view produces events. And it's often really nice to model these as streams. So we're pushing in a stream of different states into our view, and our controller is consuming a stream of events. This is nice because you can represent these as Kotlin sealed classes. You know it's one of these finite types that's going to be delivered, and you've got one pipe in and one pipe out. It feels quite nice. Um, what I do want to talk about is this event side of the fence, because this is where I've honestly seen like the best code that we've written for this. Um, this is where we, we produce code that looks something like this, where let's say we're working on a login screen, and there's two possible events that can happen on this login screen. We can attempt to log in, or we can cancel. So if we take our login button clicks, and we map them to those login attempts with the username and password, or we take the cancel button, uh, and we map that to cancel events. We can use RxJava's merge operator to put all of that together, and then we've just got this one linear stream of events coming out of our view layer. And to me, that seems really nice than sort of juggling a whole lot of these uh, methods, maybe in like an MVP architecture. And of course, this is coming from a library called RxBinding. Uh, we figured we'd already let Jake Wharton write half of our app for us anyway. We may as well let him write a little bit more. But it's more than just consume, like, pro like producing the stream of events going out. You can also use it to set up like interdependencies in views on a screen. So if we look at our login screen example again, let's say we want our login button to only be enabled when both our username field and our password field have text inside of them. We can actually set this up using Rx binding with one of my favorite operators, combined latest. So if we break it down, we're taking our text change events from our username and password views and mapping them to whether or not they're currently empty. And with combined latest, that gets us two Boolean values, has username and has password. And with a method reference from login button, it means that we've now wired up this sort of constant state now 
of when we put text in, that button is enabled, and when there's no text there, it's disabled, and that feels pretty cool. Where we've kind of had problems sometimes is in this production of that stream of states, uh, and particularly around the timing of how we forward this state into a view. So let's look at one example. Let's, let's say we're displaying a list of items, and at some point the user is going to scroll through this list, and then they're going to rotate the phone. And we want to make sure that this recycler view saves its scroll position. And sometimes this is actually very difficult to do. You need to think about the timing and what's going on here. So our view creates itself. On finish inflate is called. Then it restores its instant state. And then lastly, it draws to the screen. And if we want to make sure that this restores its instant state um, correctly, then whatever state we push into it has to happen before that restore instant state. Otherwise, we're going to be jumping back up to the top. So we would often write code that looks something like this, where our state stream is expensive to compute, and we're doing it on a background thread, and we're pushing it into the main thread once we've got it, and then displaying it. And of course, we're going to miss that window when we, when we write code that looks like this. So I thought, could we, could we cache the value that we had before rotation, uh, so that way we don't, we're not recalculating it? So I use something like replay1 and autoconnect. But of course, this actually isn't going to solve your problem. Uh, because you've got this caching operation happening before you're swapping thread context. So if you actually want this to work properly, you need to make sure you do it in the right order. Otherwise, you're still going to miss that frame window. But as long as you put that after your observe on, you should be good to go. So I want to finish up by saying it's this state stream that we've really struggled with a lot. Um, it's been nice to think about this sort of like Redux type architecture. We take a lot of inspiration from our web developers. You know, with this idea of we've got something that produces actions. Uh, you take that action and you run a reduce function with your previous state, and then ultimately that produces the new state that you you push out to your view. And I'm not saying that you can't build your Android apps this way as well. Um, we tried to. We think it's interesting. I'm just saying that as soon as you try and write something that's more complicated than a to-do app, it's very very tricky. Uh, and we're still looking for a good way to write code like this uh, that we actually like. So we're not there yet. So some final takeaways for everyone. If you're only using RxJava for callbacks with neat threading, um, maybe consider don't doing it. Maybe just consider if coroutines are going to solve all of your problems, swap to them. They're far simpler. But if you have gone down the rabbit hole, if you are using RxJava to compose a whole lot of asynchronous stuff throughout your app, then just be very careful of those terminal events, because you can end up poisoning everything and wondering, why am I not pushing any more things through my stream? Be mindful about those thread boundaries, making sure that state restores correctly, or even just missing a frame on your UI because you thought you were clever pushing something onto a background thread, but you didn't cache it in the right spot. And really, just don't Rx all of the things. I think what people don't tell you is that Rx Java is actually a lot of fun, and it's kind of addictive. Like Once you figure out how it works, you, you want to use Rx Java for everything, but you're maybe not writing the nicest code that you need to write. So if you are like me and you do find Rx Java quite fun, then I've got one last unconventional takeaway for you, uh, and that's to play this game called Opus Magnum. Uh, Opus Magnum sees you playing as an alchemist where you have input chemicals, you need to run various operators on them to produce a desired output. So maybe that will scratch the itch that you're looking for that you get from Rx Java. <laughs> but thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>